And we see that as a really important aspect of design moving forward. If you're into um, inclusive design, the mother of universal design, which was sort of the precursor to inclusive design, where we really want to understand how people are going to use a product. Patty Moore is a great example of that. And you can Google her. But great designers, as I mentioned, use their head, their heart, and their hands. Um, another great article, designers need to be specialized generalists. Being T-shaped will make you more effective. Benik Lisevsky, and you can Google this article. It's um, uh, another one of our alums, Jody Engel, uh, gave that he chairs, our, he's on our board of trustees and he chairs our uh, education committee. And so the idea is you do need to specialize, but you also need to be a generalist. As we think about art and design schools, David already gave a big shout out to College for Creative Studies. Um, but anytime, anytime you think about design, you need to think about what you're going to specialize in, but also all the other areas you want to have some experience in. Um, to an art design school, and I say art and design, you learn to give and take feedback. Some of you have started doing this in high school. I can't tell you how important it is to become comfortable in how you give feedback and certainly how you take feedback. And many times in a design school like CCS, you're getting feedback, not just from your professor, but your fellow students. So you need, you know, need, you know, you need to know how you really are able to give and take that. And that becomes almost something natural for you. Um, I imagine all, many of you on this call are all in. You can't just dabble and be an artist or just you got to be you got to be all in and one of the things that you you learn to do and many of you probably already do this is that your intent you work hard and you have inputs in order to have outputs you do research and you have a lot of observation a great example of this of look at the uh Dwayne Edwards the founder of Pencil Design Academy he was a long time Nike and Jordan brand designer to go on and found his uh design academy in Portland Oregon um and he really believes in the importance of research and observation so we need, we need and want, the world needs a lot more, better design and more creativity across the board. That's not something that's going to be replaced easily like some other areas of education. You, you learn to really create something new, authentic, or original, and that is not easy to do. And some people are you know, very, very difficult to do. And, but art and design schools like CCS help you figure out how to be new, create something new, authentic, or original. You also learn to see the world more thoughtfully and thoroughly from different perspectives. You've heard these terms already of UX and UI, virtual reality, augmented reality, user interface design. Um, you, at places like um, CCS, you learn 3D animation, not just if you're a gamer, which is where it started out, but we have transportation students that are using Unreal Engine, uh, which is a gaming software to do 3D animations for products, 3D animations for cars, um, for all types of industrial design. So, the other thing uh, that, that a book that's out in terms of what skills you're going to need in the future. So the five meta skills of talents for future work by Marty Niemeyer, empathy and intuition. And I go back to what David said too already about the importance of emotion that designers have that part. And, but the, also the importance of intuition, you know what you know, how do you, and it, that comes with experience. Malcolm Gladwell has a great book called Blink, how we develop intuition over over time with great experience. Another one of the skills that in the, the meta skills are talking about seeing and systems thinking and how systems thinking is really important in terms of developing better solutions for the problems of the world are gonna come from more and more good design. I love this next one, dreaming, applied imagination. How do you take your dreams and make them real? I, I think at a place like CCS, and you, great, you do great industrial design, product design, transportation design, communication design. You also do things in illustration or entertainment arts where film and animation concept design. Um, you'll see an alum in a minute that works for CCS that I think he, he's a great example of applied imagination. Making, I mentioned that already, design and testing. You learn a lot by making things with your hands, making things with a computer having a worker or maker space. And some of you, I imagine, have things in your basement or your garage or your parents' garage. But I would encourage you um, to work on a computer and all different softwares. Don't, you can actually download um, a free personal use of Unreal Engine, but also making three-dimensional. Three um, you also uh, uh, learning autodidactics, that's self-directed learning. Um, a person who writes about this, Young Zhao, but many of you are self-directed learners. You've learned a lot. You've taught yourself a lot about design. You're good on learning on your own. 
or in groups. So it's important to think about. But these five skills, as we think about breadth and depth, the meta skills takes it even a little bit farther in terms of what skills and orientations you need to be a great uh, designer and, uh, for your future. I mentioned him a minute ago. Here's a guy who, who's applied dreams. So uh, Tim Flattery has done over hundred films. He's a concept designer. He was a transportation design major in the big eighties, as I call it. Um, and this is just one of his many films that he's done, but he takes his imagination and, and develops concepts for, for uh, films. And he's doing Thor right now, the uh, concept design for the movie Thor, which is gonna come out. Some of you might recognize this. This is Tim Flattery's concept for the gauntlet. Um, and that's, that's his avatar. When he, when he takes his camera off on Zoom, this is what you see. But he's a great example of applying his imagination. And I think that that's something, and I commend you on for, for, for thinking about design and art, to taking that risk, being brave about going with your imagination and being creative. So you synthesize, you work across many disciplines, you use, you use a wide range of tools. Some of you maybe have experimented with not just computer software, but 3D printers, laser cutters. We have rapid prototyping. We've got a lot of cool stuff. We, we used to, we, at CCS, we call it our world-class facilities. But you create, you learn to create products and processes in a more sustainable way for the greater good. And here's one of my favorites. You learn to create the cutting edge, not just beyond. Everybody wants to be on the cutting edge, but it's artists and designers like yourselves who are cultural producers. You're creating the future by creating that cutting edge. One of my favorite examples of design for social good is Veronica Scott. And she created this company called the Empowerment Plan. When she was a student at CCS, she was in product design. And her, her senior project was to create a winter coat for people without homes. So she started to do an inclusive design process. She talked to folks who didn't have a home and asked them about a winter coat. And a number of them said, we don't need a winter coat, we need a job. So what she did is create the Empowerment Plan, which not only was a company to create these winter coats and all different designs that, 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 that surface uh, people without uh, homes, but they also actually, uh, she hires people without, without homes or homeless people that we used to call them. So this is a great, great program. I've got a chance to meet Veronica, I'll go to her shop on the east side of Detroit, but it's a great story about how product design and designers tend to make the world better. Great example of that. So you, did, you, do, you develop different models of artistic practice you learn your creativity. How do you apply that creativity in multiple ways? So how do you make a living doing that and work in many different organizations? CCS has what we call sponsored projects. We work with all different for-profit and non-profit companies where they come to us with different challenges that they throw to our students and say, can you help us with a design problem here? And we, we have some great examples here. Um, we have a great craft program. And we actually had our fibers and textile students design removable wallpaper. This is one of my favorite pro sponsored projects where our students designed wallpaper for Fathead. Um, so you, you learn to in, in, innovate, improvise, collaborate, execute with excellence. And I can't stress enough about the excellence part. Some of you might start a company or be an entrepreneur in your future to create positive change and be a cultural producer and also learn the importance of storytelling. Many of our students, not, no matter what their major is, learn to tell stories and explain their products, explain their processes. And so we have an alum that's gone on to, some of you might watch Big City Greens, another one applied imagination here, if you watch any episodes there. Um, we have a couple of alums that are working on the Mandalorian. They can, and they're like 2019 alums. Again, of concept designers applying their imagination and creativity to a, a, a show that goes on right now. Um, we have an alum, Wendy Freud, who uh, did all the Yodas from 1977 to 1983. And she was a fine arts with a focus in fabric design major. Another one of our alums, Doug Chang, vice president, creative director at Star Wars, hired, hired by George Lucas directly. Um, we have alums that have gone on to do apps for, for smartphones and advertising, um, footwear design coming out of CCS, all these different companies. Um, we have Design Core, which sponsors Month of Design and Michigan um, Design Council is part of that. You can also work in the community for their community arts partnerships. And here's some of the companies that we, um, we collaborate with. You recognize all these companies, all of them have done sponsored projects. And so I wanna finally end up 
like many of you, you've had to deal with COVID last spring, this fall, so have we. We actually had our transportation design students have a sponsored project with Mustang. Mustang, Ford Mustang came to us, the designers and said, can you reimagine what the Mustang can be like in 10 years? So our students started working on this and they couldn't do their clay models because COVID hit. They couldn't do their storyboards because COVID hit. So what they ended up doing is animating. Their they learned to do animation with Unreal Engine to animate their, their, their Mustang designs and the four designers loved it. And so all those students learned a whole new uh, skill set beyond clay modeling and storyboards to animate their designs. It's only a couple of minutes. But you don't think about the Mustang being quite like this. Although the current Mustang designs are cool, but this is very cool too. Yeah, this, this was like all students t t teaching themselves this during COVID. Yeah, this is a Mustang I would dream up. I love it. Yeah. Reimagining you know, the Mustang. Playing, as is playing, Don, a point you said that I really love, which is meaningful to this competition, is the fact that you really pointed out the, the need for being a well rounded thinker. And, you know, not everybody here is going to end up being a designer. Um, right. I would love for everybody here to end up being a designer. That would be awesome. But the reality is what we're really trying to teach through this uh, activity is the power of problem solving. And every student here is going to use that in their future, whether it's through the rest of their K through 12 education or in their career afterwards. That, that well-rounded thinking, problem solving, empathetic, looking at life through, through the shoes of someone else is meaningful. Yep. Yep. And I also love your point about storytelling. Um, it, it, you can have an idea, but if you can't tell a good story, um, it really will never get off of your doodle pad uh, that you have or, or, or whatever project you might be working on in your bedroom. You need to be able to tell that story. And actually that's really part of the process here in selecting the finalists which is reading their written descriptions of their designs is how the finalists are selected. So that first step of storytelling is in this project because that description is the first thing that, that gets all of the hundreds to thousands of students in the state that submit, the finalists are first screened by their description and their ability to tell the story of their design. So great points there. So Don, that was fantastic. Yeah, I love those points. So I'm going to move over here to uh, Jeff DeBoer. And Jeff is our chairman. And I just want Jeff to kind of give a little bit of description of the process of um, how we select the finalists and how we go through this activity. So Jeff, you're, I see you up there somewhere. You got to just unmute yourself. Yep, I'm, okay. I'm here. Fantastic. I can hear you. I'm ready to go. Are you going to put the slides up, uh, Dave? Yep, I'm going to put them up here so that way we are ready to go. Well, everybody, it, it really warms my heart that we have, I think, over 80 participants. And I know there are many, many people watching one laptop right now. So I'm, I'm sure we have more than 100 folks, uh, students, teachers, parents, grandparents joining us. So that is truly, truly amazing. And All right, I, do we got the screen share going? Well, I can see it. <laughs> you can see it, all right. I can, okay, can you, can you go back one slide, Dave? There we go. Not just because I wanna look at myself standing on a stage, because <laughs> that's not very interesting. What's truly interesting and fascinating is, is Don was, was talking, it just, uh, I just was getting excited all over again, you know, why we do what we do, why we try to solve these seemingly impossible challenges that we tee up every year through the design council. And, and you know, Dave, as you were talking and Don, you were sharing some, some amazing quotes. It, it was kind of reminding me that this, this whole journey I went through personally, you know, both from the art and the science side. And I think at the time when I was in school, going through college, I was, I was so close to it, I didn't really understand maybe where it was gonna take me. And it wasn't until later that I, I, I realized sort of the magic of the coming together of art and design and, and the, the, the power that gave me to, to solve these, these huge challenges, which, which all of you tackled this year. 
So my passion is solving problems in a way that's never been done before. And just as a way to improve people's lives, both, you know, as Dave said, emotionally and functionally through the utility of products and, and services. All right, Dave. Thanks. So the challenge. So every year the Michigan Design Council sits down and we, we spend a lot of time crafting the challenge. You can see the 2020 challenge on the bottom of the slide, design a product to help Michigan residents grow, transport, cook, package or serve healthy food sourced from within Michigan. We, we truly agonize over this challenge because it could be a lot of different things, but what it really needs to do is it needs to speak to Michigan somehow with a, a greater potential impact on the uh, rest of society. And I think this, this particular 2020 challenge really struck that note. So the challenge is, is, is tackled by hundreds of students all over the state. Every student is tackling the same challenge, but they're doing it in very different ways. And I, and I think it bears kind of restating that this challenge and actually participating in the Michigan Design Prize is, is above and beyond the normal um, daily uh, work that students are putting in, that teachers are putting in through the course of the school day. It really is above and beyond. And the final selection is done by the board of the Michigan Design Council. So if we can move forward. And I think I wanna reiterate again as well, because there, sometimes there's some confusion that the judging criteria that we use when all the entries start to come in are not based on how fancy and polished and professional a rendering or a model might be, um, because that, that will come later, but it's really just about the quality of the thinking and the quality of the core idea that the, the student has through their entry. So creativity, the level of originality, discovery, and, and approaches to the solution they have related to our challenge. Significance, you know, is it really meaningful and, and relevant to the topic of the topic being food this year. The level of design thinking and visualization, you know, design thinking is kind of a buzzword that's been around for a while now. We, we always kind of laugh amongst ourselves as designers and, and kind of say to ourselves, this, this is really just what we do, right? I mean, we think like designers. And like Don was saying, you know, it's considering a lot of different inputs from all different walks of society. And I often challenge our designers and, and students I work with to, to always be inspired and always be ready to tackle a problem that you may not know is coming at you. You just always need to be ready to, to tackle the problem with the tools you have. And then finally, the value, the level of potential impact on our industry and our economy. Michigan historically has a, a, a huge manufacturing economy and that's been, been changing and, and evolving over the last several years and it, it may be changing forever. So the, the impact of your particular idea, the potential impact on could a business be started? Is this something that, that you could pursue as a young entrepreneur? I think those are all key things that we look at as, as a judge. And then we go through all the various awards. This usually takes quite a bit of time. And we come up with those that we think are, are, are worthy of, of moving forward, okay? And then finally, uh, much of tonight is dedicated to the students and the work they did. And I promise we're gonna get there in just a few instances. <laughs> I think if I had received one of those letters in the mail, I don't think I could have been patient enough and waited to open it. I probably would have snuck it in another room <laughs> and uh, taken a peek, but that's just me. So uh, I'm sure some of you are still uh, eagerly waiting to uh, see what's inside. In addition to the awards that uh, we provide for students and, and the awards to finalists are, are, are a mentoring session, as David talked about, we thought that was the most valuable thing we could really offer. We always thought it was equally important to recognize and reward instructors and administrators um, in their school systems who really also go above and beyond in clearing the way for students to take risks and be curious and tackle the Michigan design challenge. 
And it's, it's a tough thing, especially when your day is packed full of other uh, you know, requirements that, that teachers have to teach, that administrators have to support through the teachers. So what we did a few years ago is we commissioned a Michigan fine artist, Dave Gennard, to design and make this bespoke sculpture, which is called Aspiration. And if, if you look at it closely, if you have the opportunity to see it in person, it's really super cool. It is cast out of stainless steel. And if you look at around the, kind of the bottom of the sculpture, there are a lot of materials and tools you might recognize. I can see some pencils, maybe some paint brushes and rulers in there, things that we use as designers to create and design. And as you develop confidence through mentoring and guidance, your idea becomes defined and your concept starts to morph and evolve and, and it becomes a, a strong, positive, confident gesture through the work of mentoring. And that is represented with the, the swoosh that you can see on top. And if, if you squint your eyes and you kind of use your imagination, you might even see the mitten state in there somewhere. So, and I know Dave is going to talk more about that and uh, tell us all who our, our lucky um, instructor is this year as we move forward. So Dave, I'm going to leave it with that because I know everybody is very, very anxious to get on with the actual awarding. Yes, yes. So, so let's move on uh, to this year's recipient, which is Marvin Gage. And Marvin's here with us. Um, I'm going to play uh, a little acceptance speech that, that he's given. Um, but I want to point out that Marvin has two of the three high school finalists um, this year. And what's amazing is that when the board is selecting the uh, finalists, we're, uh, we're not looking at all at the schools that they come from. So it's really a testament to the quality of what his students put out that two of the three are from the same school. So really awesome work and Marvin has been um, very active and we, we email often um, about the M Prize. So I'm gonna play a little speech here um, from him. It is an honor to be named Educator of the Year by the Michigan Design Council. This award would not have been possible without having dedicated students and the support of administrators and staff. I would like to thank the Michigan Design Council for holding the Michigan Design Challenge competition each year. The competition has become part of my, my engineering curriculum, helping me teach the design process in a group setting. The Michigan Design Council has helped to make this process easier by giving a problem statement, a client company, and a target consumer. From there, my students have been able to develop their design brief, creating their design statement and constraints. Working in small groups, they went through the brainstorming process, generating concepts and starting to develop a solution. As a team, they each were assigned different areas of the project. Once the design of the project was arrived at, a prototype was constructed. The prototype could be a virtual model or a 3D printed model. Testing and redesigning occurred until a final product was arrived at. The final stage of this design process was a written and visual presentation, which was then submitted with the final two weeks being done virtually. I know that being a teacher and a student during these last 10 months has been really tough. Having been a teacher in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s, and now the 20s, I have seen a lot from 9-11, Hurricane Katrina, where I had a student come to me from New Orleans, Hurricane Henry, where I had a student come from Texas, and now COVID-19. I know we can work our way through this with the help of the Michigan Design Challenge competition. Good luck with this year's competition, and I hope to see you in person at the 2021 awards ceremony. So, uh, sorry if the audio or the video was a little scratchy. It's it's the, the it's what we have to deal with with a virtual ceremony. Um, but I, I I do see that Marvin's here. Marvin, if you want to unmute and say something, but uh, you know Marvin is from the Branch Area Career Center. What I love about that 
is that he's working on a program that's looking at building skills directly for students to apply in their future. So thank you, Marvin. Let's give all, a, you know, it's a virtual clap for, for Marvin and his efforts. I would just like to say that, hey, I am happy that this ceremony is happening because now I can wrap up the 2019-2020 school year. <laughs> I've, been waiting, I've been waiting to to end that school year and this is one way we can end it. Yes, absolutely. We're all happy to get here. Okay, so uh, we're gonna move into the awards now. And I just wanna show here um, all of the companies that have given of their designers time. Uh, we have designers from companies you might be familiar with like General Motors or Converse or Zenith if you're into football, but we also have some other groups, uh, Human, we had two designers um, from Human, which is a, a Harman division. Tactile is a design consulting firm. And then we have myself and a couple other designers we'll get to from Sunberg Farrar, who's been really a, a partner from the beginning with the uh, Michigan Design Council. Uh, Sunberg Farrar has, has generously donated its time and efforts through, through all of the uh, M prizes um, since day one. So special thank you to that. The Michigan Economic Development Corp also has uh, been a key funding uh, partner with us to to help us cover the expenses it takes to actually run this every year, and uh, and Whole Mind Design uh, with Katie and Diane on our board. This is a group here that that helps educators understand the power of design. So if there's any educators um, in the room that would love to go to our website, there is a form there where you can reach out to us or info at michigandesigncouncil.org. And Katie and Diane offer services to help. Um, get design into your classroom with, with uh, uh, some great tools and resources and even some workshops. So if you're interested, please reach out to us and I'll connect you. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go through each category. I'm going to reveal the, the image with the finalists um, first, second or third prize. And then we're going to show the professional designers work that they've done. So without further ado, we'll get into K through two. So third place uh, bronze award goes to Danielle William with her food shirt design. Uh, I, see, I see Danielle, I saw her on here. So congratulations to you. Teacher is Dina Treadwell and her mentor was Arthur Brown from Continental. And this was a, a food shirt that you could wear it and it, it gives you food um, and you type in what you want and, and how much of it. Um, so it's not like a backpack where you have to carry the food but it kind of like makes your food when you need it. And, and I think the drawings really are gonna describe this uh, better than I can. So here's uh, Arthur's design collaboration. Um, and so you can see the different pockets. And Arthur, I, I think I saw you on the list here. If you wanna unmute and tell us a couple things about the experience or working uh, with Danielle, are you there? Mm -mm. Say hi. Yeah, I'm here. Are you able to hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Danielle, awesome. I should, I sorry, I was having some technical issues. Danielle's here too. She's just being shy. <laughs> Hi, Arthur. Hey, how you doing? Monica? Hey, Danielle. Uh, so yeah, this is the uh, the end result of the food shirt collaboration that we had. I uh, really enjoyed working on the project. And obviously, for every, like everyone, we had to kind of deal with the challenge of uh, COVID make this connection for the mentorship but we worked with what we had uh, we were able to find a place to meet and you know even with some social distancing we still kind of had a good decent exchange uh, and I'm hoping the end result lives up to <laughs> Danielle's expectations but basically yeah she her idea was that of a, of a food shirt that basically frees up your arms so you don't have to dig around in a backpack to give you you know give you a snack or whatever whenever you're kind of hungry so you're still able to use your arms to do things and not have to be distracted by finding your food in a different location and uh, it's one of the the joys i think i had from from working with this is really and jeff touched on it before is about this risk taking and the the, the whole idea about this free exploration that i really enjoy about working I really not hindered or encumbered by a lot of things that I think as, as you grow professionally as an adult and even just, you know, as professionally as designer that you're constantly bombarded with newer and other restrictions that kind of weigh you down in terms of how you find solutions. And I think working with younger creatives uh, is really freeing. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> yeah, I, I love the, but, uh, I love the animated face that tells you when it's uh, your snack is ready and then it drops out the shoot at the bottom. That's awesome. <laughs> 
So yeah, basically the gist of the shirt, uh, the shirt itself has different pouches, basically ingredients. So there's a main little unit that mixes the ingredients and creates different types of snacks based on what the person wants. And they're able to control that through a phone app or they're able to do just kind of a, a, a random select if they actually just touch the device itself on, on the shirt itself. And there's cool. all kind of a, uh, a hydro uh, water pack basically Dr. Uh, on the back that also uses the, the, the mixing of the ingredients, but the, the wearer can also just sip water from that for, for like. When did Newman's going to make it? I don't know. So I got uh, uh, some sketches here too. Did you guys do these? Did you do these during your session or pass these back and forth? To talk about it's some a of little those. bit of both. Yeah, some of them. Uh, some of the sketches, those on, I would say the right side were kind of done live, and I did. I was doing some studies of my own, just trying to resolve some mechanical things for, for a proposal. But um, very cool. So it was a little bit of a mix. Well, thank you, thank you, Arthur, and uh, thank you, Danielle, and I see your mom, Monica, with you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I enjoyed it. <laughs> it was great. All right. So we're going to move on to Silver Award. Silver Award goes to Blake Rudy. Blake is a, a two year in a row winner. She was one of the finalists actually last year also. Um, so we got a real creative uh, powerhouse uh, uh, here at, at Roosevelt Elementary. Uh, teachers Julianne O'Brien. Um, and designer is Connor Regal from Zenith. Connor, I, don't, I wasn't sure if you made it or not. If you're there, just go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, but this is the Huskillator. Um, and uh, it's a pretty a fantastic machine that uh, takes corn husks here grown in Michigan and runs them through this awesome machine that grinds up and turns it basically into paper that is then pressed and turn into biodegradable packaging. So this awesome biodegradable stamping uh, package machine pumps out boxes and we can then ship food in those boxes made from corn husks. So uh, I, see, I see Blake there. If you wanna unmute, thank you so much. Thank you. So <laughs> second, year, second year as a finalist how do you feel about that okay. um good I last year I had like no idea what it was about like I just started and when I was in first grade my teacher um Jennifer Graham came out and told me and I was like super excited and I had no idea what was gonna happen awesome and I see your teacher Julianne also on here Julianne thank you so much for supporting I know you've had students um, entering this contest every year since, since we began. So, uh, you know, we couldn't do this without teachers like yourself. Okay, so we're gonna move on to first place and the gold award winner is Cecilia Byron for the food delivery box. She's from Bingham Farms Elementary. So full disclosure, this is my daughter. <laughs> and I even considered not having her enter the competition but I couldn't, my heart couldn't do that because she was so excited uh, to enter. And when she submitted a design, I told the board, I said, I, I am not involved. I am not gonna touch this design at all. And in fact, I removed myself from selecting the finalists in this age category. So that way the other board members would be the ones picking and they didn't know who was who. Like I said, we don't look at the schools or the names. We just read the descriptions to pick the finalists. So, I was kind of shocked and said, wow, this is fantastic. I'm so excited for my daughter here. Um, so her design idea here is, uh, is Diego on? I'm not sure, I didn't see him on. He might still be working. Uh, he's a Converse designer. And Diego worked here with Cecilia to develop a carrot delivery box. And I know Jeff, uh, who, who he was just speaking here, Jeff uh, really loved the uh, kind of obviously pandemic time sensitivity of this idea to have a box on the outside of your house that when you order fresh food, it is safely delivered. And then on the inside, there's an opening and you can then uh, pull the food out from the inside of your house. So in a way, basically, it's the modern milk mailbox. Um, I don't think she's ever seen a milk mailbox and I had no idea where this idea came from, but I think it was 
just from the fact that we were doing Kroger delivery and getting groceries brought in from Kroger and all kind of panicking in, in back in March and had this idea of having a carrot delivery box so we could safely get carrots. So Cecilia, you can unmute for a second. Hi. Uh, I feel like the idea was really good because it was really clean and during this situation um i just thought like hmm, maybe we need something cleaner and maybe it can be involved with a mailbox so that's how i got my idea awesome thank you <laughs> So yeah, Diego uh, put together this final result here and he also, uh, I was really impressed with uh, his virtual uh, session with her. What they did is he had a, a digital pen um, active while they were doing their session and he was sketching out ideas and he was kind of mind mapping this carrot delivery box. So here's some of the initial sketches he did um, and they talked about it possibly being down by the street or connecting it actually to your house and that's how he got to the final design. All right, so on to third and fifth grade. So bronze goes to Charlie Green for the hydroponic food truck. Charlie, see you there, you can unmute. Um, so I actually got to mentor Charlie. And when we got together, uh, we talked about this food truck that would travel to neighborhoods and actually have fresh grown plants in the truck. So not just a delivery truck bringing boxed produce from the farm, but actually growing it in the truck with a tank of water in the bottom that would have fish in it. And she had seen or learned, Charlie, what, did you learn in a science class about fish um, hydroponically giving nutrients to grow plants? Where did you, where did you learn about that? I, I can't remember. It was actually weird. I actually learned it from a trip. Oh, you're unmuted, but I'm not hearing you. Oh. oh there you go. There you go. Okay. Sorry. I actually learned it from a trip to Disney. It was at Epcot. And oh, was yeah, that's right. And a certain ride, and it was about things growing. It was full of all sorts of, um, it was it was like a learning ride. It was a boat ride. And I remember seeing the hydroponics, and I just remember asking my mother after afterwards what it was and how do we use it. And I just remember that memory being fresh in my mind as I was brainstorming. So parents, all the money it costs to go to Disney and Epcot, look at what it inspired, it pays off. <laughs> so, so yeah, this, uh, as we were kind of collaborating over this, uh, Charlie said, well, maybe it could be solar powered and you could run the pumps to circulate the water. And, and you know, she was talking about a food truck, how it has a, like a stand in the front where people um, pay. So she said, well, maybe each family could get a certain amount of produce. They could pick it right off of the plants and then weigh it. So when it goes into the neighborhood, each family would get, let's say two pounds of fresh vegetables on that trip while the truck was growing those vegetables. So I thought this is like, this is the next level of what food trucks should be like, not just delivering food that has to be cut and delivered, but actually growing it in the truck. I, I, lo I love the idea. So fa fantastic work there, Charlie. Hold on. Okay, I got, sorry, I'm so sorry. So I'm, this is a silver award here. I think this guy messed up here, but silver award goes to a team here of Miriam, William, uh, William, Jatifa Benjamin, and Marta Glick for the Green Machine. And the Green Machine um, is for, uh, design guys are from the team from Roosevelt, uh, Christina, Sefila. I've seen a couple of you on here. I'm just trying to catch names. I see Christina, Sefila as your teacher. Um, I see Marta Glick, Jatifa, Miriam, William. Um, so this was a great team effort. And so the green machine was designed uh, here in collaboration with Matt Morocco. Matt, I, I saw you on here. So if you want to unmute from human design, um, tell us a little bit about the green machine. Sure. Uh, yeah, thanks for, uh, for getting me involved in this. Uh, it was a total blast. Uh, and I have to hand it to 
um, to my team, to the girls there, they, they had this thing like fully fleshed out in their mind down to the details of how this thing would function, um, how it should look, um, and what the community would get out of, of having this. It's not uh, totally dissimilar from the previous concept where it is a food truck, but the idea is that it's, it is a mobile way to get healthy organic foods into underserved areas and food deserts, and it um, engages the community in uh, picking their own food, selecting their own food, um, and actually pulling it from the dirt and and washing it. So it's this like very wholesome yeah. uh, family experience centered around healthy organic foods and creating um, better eating habits, right? With your kids and raising them in that way. And, and um, the idea of creating a brand around this that uh, creates jobs and all of that great stuff, um, was maybe the to me the the most fun part. So the name came from them. The how this should look. Uh, <laughs> I tried to to follow their guidance as, as closely as I could, but the idea was that um, it should be approachable and very friendly. So that um, because you want to get kids to be interested in eating vegetables. So not only does the truck look very friendly and cute and something you want to go up and engage with. Um, but they had this awesome idea for these veggie molds that you could actually grow the vegetables into fun shapes to make kids want to interact with them um, instead of just like a random sort of natural vegetable shape. Um, and then there was even the idea that you could create custom 3D printed ones and customize it in that way. Um, but yeah, it was it was fun to work with them and uh, we had a great session also where we got to meet in person. Uh, first, I remotely showed them our design studio in Novi, and then we met um, immediately after that to do uh, have like a sketch uh, session. And um, man, totally enriching experience and uh, honored that, uh, that we got to place. So congrats, awesome. ladies, I, I had a blast. Great, well, here, I think, so these are some of the sketches that you did at your uh, get together. So. Girls, you can unmute, uh, you know, thank Matt or tell us a little bit about uh, the sketches here. Is each one of these one of the different team members? No, each of them are Miriam. Miriam, um, oh except wow. Except for the, the bunny truck is Jatifa's. Um, yeah. Now the, <laughs> yeah. the cool. green machine was actually like, um, we all had different ideas and then we kind of mixed them together to make this. We thought of our mascots and we decided that they should spell out eco. So we have Ender the owl, Crystal the bunny, and Opal the cat. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh Lord. That's really cool. And and you know what, Matt, you did an awesome job taking Jatipa's bunny truck with the wheels and everything. And, and like you really <laughs> Yeah, if I look at that sketch. Yeah, it, it was very important. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the front cab is just really, really incredible. It's it's awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Awesome. Well, thank you. And I think that's really great when a team can work together like this and have fun and uh, uh, and just bring a playfulness to to their concept. So really good work, ladies. And gold award goes to Ashley Hartman for the food bot. Another Roosevelt. Um, I'm just going to point out here that uh, five of the six finalists in all elementary categories came from Roosevelt. And I see a couple of the teachers here from Roosevelt. I mean, just give a hands up to Roosevelt overall. Um, I, I was able to come one time and attend their design day. And man, they, they just shut the whole school down for a day and do a day of design to, to tackle this Emprise competition and really do a great job. So Ashley here um, worked with Will Turner from General Motors. And uh, this is a disinfect, uh, disinfected uh, machine. And so really timely, obviously you were thinking about pandemic, um, cleanliness and access to food. Um, and uh, I'm gonna get to the design here so we can see this really awesome food bot 
and there's loading and, it, and uh, working with Will to kind of create sort of like a, a microwave uh, feel to it. So Will, are you, are you here? I didn't see you, but are you on? So maybe Will might be also working too at five o'clock still. Work, General Motors working them hard. <laughs> but uh, um, Ashley, you want to share any thoughts about your design here? I yes, absolutely. Um, so basically my food bot was meant to disinfect food from like a long time ago because I always remember when I was little, my grandma would have like random like foods in the cupboard and like say there was like a honey in front of it and it was like brand new. And then there was one behind it that was from like a couple years ago. And that could be the same for like stuffing or anything really. So I, so I remembered that like memory. And then I was like, wait, my mom also got food poisoning once and it was really hard for, well, us. And so I thought, hey, what if I made a thing that could disinfect food um, or anything? And it would be really cool. It also doubles as a microwave. And if you look, I'm sorry about my dogs. They're barking a little bit over there. But anyways, back to my point. So on the top um, picture, if you look beside like the food bot, those are the food bot minis, which are basically, have you, like, I bet a lot of people in here have seen thermoses. And basically, they're just like little cup looking things. And um this one works the same as a microwave it has the food bot it has a on and off button um a little keypad for it and it also heats up um and cools down as the food bot does as well and it's a really simple but cool design and that's really all i have to say about it awesome ashley i love i could tell how excited you are about your design and that's really you know what what this is all about yeah because this is really important to me because normally i don't really win the design prize but how many this times year have you how many times have you entered well since kindergarten since kindergarten <laughs> Yeah, but either way, I'm really happy that I actually had the chance to do it this year and I won, so. That is awesome. I'm, I'm really happy for you. I mean, just the fact that you've really done this since kindergarten and really, you know, Roosevelt, again, you guys do a great job, but wow, that's really cool. I did not know that and I, I'm really happy for you, Ashley. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to move on to middle school now. So bronze award goes to Mar Marissa Monroe and Jaden Jaden Bulkins uh, for the garden protectors. Are you guys here? I think I saw one of you on. If you want, unmute. So Josiah Lacola, I know you're here. I saw you um, from Sunberg Farrar. And tackling this concept, the goal was to keep animals out of your crops or your flower beds, so they have a good season for growing, and it protects your crops. And when I, we first read this, we kind of were thinking of uh, a, a, like a scarecrow, but for your garden. And uh, Josiah took this to a whole nother level. <laughs> so Josiah, you can unmute and tell us about the, the garden protector. Yeah, the next level is a good way to put it. Um, I just had to have some fun with this in a way because it, it was uh, quite a bit like a, a new electronic scarecrow, right? And exactly. uh, I was trying to uh, teach teach the kids about scalability, right? So there's there is a smaller version of it. I think you're going to show that soon. But this was the full size version for the uh, <laughs> for the other uh, you know farms and and larger gardens, uh, vegetable gardens. Something that would you know get up and actually chase away any pests and and other things like that. So yeah, just trying to have some good fun and introduce some robotics to you know actual movements and things to- Precisely uh, calculated, non-lethal non blows <laughs> to all threats. I, <laughs> I like it. Hey, it's not gonna hurt, in, it, it's, it's shame-based, not, <laughs> not pain-based. Yeah. And then you yeah. have the, the little guy over here, the autonome, 
which is perfect for any, uh, you know, little flower bed out in front of your house or anything. Yeah, so I, I can tell you just, you know, you started with the root of the idea and just really had fun with it. So um, really, thank you. Thank you for that. I mean, this this was so exciting for me when I saw it. I I, <laughs> I kind of just fell in love with it. And uh, I can't <laughs> wait to see the, the flower bed auto gnome Gen 2. <laughs> yes, yeah. No, it was awesome to uh, to participate again and uh, to hear their ideas come to life here. Awesome, thank you. Silver Award goes to a team here of Sydney Wenberg, uh, Alessandra Rosales, and Cassidy Shoburn for the automatic employee robot, uh, White Pines Intermediate, teacher Aaron uh, Schillinger, and the designer is David Dixon, also from uh, Human. Uh, so this one here, um, this allows people to pick their dishes um, at, a, at a restaurant and collect their ingredients, cook their own food, the customer can pay with cash or credit card. And uh, this was just a, to us, we thought it was a really interesting design looking at how to rethink the restaurant experience and um, putting this entry in when they did after we had some shutdown experience. I think we we're all trying to figure out what is the future of a restaurant experience. Um, is Dave Dixon on here? So in the storyboard here, I'll just, we can all kind of see and follow through here. Uh, you, you order, um, then the customers can hang out and wait while the order arrives and then cook their own meals. Uh, this makes the experience more interactive. I love that it, it's kind of, to me, was like almost like the digital new version of Mongolian barbecue is what I was thinking when I saw the design come in from Dave Dixon. Um, do we have any of the, the three ladies from this team here? If you want, is anybody here? Sydney or Cassie or Allison? Hi. Hey, do you want to tell us a little bit about the, uh, working uh, together and coming up with this idea? Um, so it was more like being able to like make it more hands-on. Like that idea where you could be able to like do it yourself instead of def um, depending on somebody else. So it was more independent. I got you. So yeah, just really having control of the process of being able to pick the food, pick the ingredients, cook it yourself. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. And definitely, uh, you know, obviously right now is something I think that's very timely. And uh, I think the design here from Dave is very clean and simple. Uh, the interactive screen, I think I like the height um, and the adjustability of the screen to slide up and down here. Um, so really, really great design here, the, the automatic employee robot. And we've got some sketches here. I always think it's really fun and exciting to see these sketches from the designers and kind of look through the process of how they thought out where to put the screen. You know, David did a really good job exploring some different shapes. What does the kiosk look like? Um, and, and where's the payment station versus where the screen is? You can see the up and down arrows here, but these are really, really cool designs. And I love kind of the, the, the behind the scenes look at, at these when the designers are, are, are working out the idea on paper. And gold goes to uh, a team of two young gentlemen here, Nolan Illage and Lucas Hines for the Berry Straws, uh, Sterling Middle School in West Branch. Trisha Ziegler and the designer is Evan Carpenter Crawford from Sunberg Farrar. So these uh, berry rush jars are eco-friendly. Uh, it's a, it's a, they're edible uh, drinking straws and they also cool your drink. Um, so they can be made of fruit. And uh, I, I think the, the collaboration and the work that Evan did is, is really, really great. I, I think Evan, you're here. If you wanna unmute and tell us a little bit about the design. Thought I saw Evan on here earlier. All right, maybe Evan had to go, but um, so adding refreshing flavor to any drink. I mean, what's really cool is this little packet here and you can pull the straws out and buy different starter kits. Um, and then it's it dissolves in this. So you have this uh, frozen core in the middle. So as you're drinking, it's chilling it. And then uh, you have a fruit liner uh, this one here had uh, a little bit of a cereal sleeve to give it some some uh, structure to it, and then a gummy wrap around it. 
And I'm just really impressed for, as a, from one designer to another at the CAD modeling and CAD rendering that Evan did here to get these images and the condensation on it. I mean, a lot of really cool attention to detail. And Evan also sent us some of his development sketches and looking at the different holsters because these would go in the freezer to get cooled. And then how do you pull them out? I mean, it's kind of like those little silicone. Anybody ever make popsicles at home? You know, it's kind of starting with that idea where you pull the little homemade popsicles out of the silicone mold and, and then uh, uh, kind of built off of that idea, but using the cereal to give it structure so it doesn't just fall apart and crumble, but then you can kind of eat it afterwards. So uh, is uh, Lucas or, or Nolan here? You guys wanna? Yep, I'm here. Yeah, tell us a little bit about the idea and uh, working with Evan. This is true. Well, we wanted to make a straw that would reduce waste and waste uh, areas. And so we came up with this idea. That's a good point that it's just, you know, not only is it just fun and flavorful and just a great experience, but it has actually an eco uh, benefit as well with so many of the straws being taken away or straws being turned from plastic into paper now um, being a real on topic uh, point here. Awesome, this is really cool work guys. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna move on to high school students. And bronze award goes to a team here with Serafina Che, Esther Yu, and Victoria Brown. The Optic Garden. So they're from uh, Washtenaw uh, International High School. Um, I know Esther I recognized as a multiple winner also. I know she's been a finalist in the past, Esther. So really appreciate you continuing. I think you were uh, in middle school when you won uh, yeah, I see you nod. Okay, I see your video up there. So you're really awesome, awesome work. Um, and working with the team here, they worked with Brian Young um, to uh, design a mobile garden so that you could move this around. It connects via Bluetooth. It's basically a community garden and, and allows it to be more accessible so people know when it's arriving in their local area. Um, I'll move over here and I think we got Brian attending here. So Brian, you could tell us a minute about this and then uh, give uh, the ladies a chance to share their ideas. So Brian, how, how did you come to this and working and collaborating uh, with the ladies? Well, I, first I wanna say uh, thank you uh, to um, uh, everyone and, and to Serafina, Esther and uh, uh, Victoria. Um, it, it was a great collaboration. We actually had a couple of Zoom calls and I just asked questions and allowed them to ask me questions. And uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, they laid everything out and uh, it was pretty much paint by number. Quite frankly, <laughs> they, they gave me more information uh, to help generate uh, the renderings than I usually get in my, my <laughs> project briefs from work. So that was, uh, <laughs> that, that was, that was pretty good. But um, I, I, I tell you it, the, the imagination and the creativity and the, um, the passion uh, that, that the, the three young ladies that I was paired with, it just humbled me. I wish I had that focus when I was their age and in school. So I just took uh, their concept and what they laid out and I applied uh, uh, some creativity and some and some fun, uh, some fun to it. Yeah, I love the, just, I love the hand drawing. A uh, couple of, you know, the designers here. I, I just I think it's cool because this is a hand drawn design. Matt Morocco's was a hand drawn design. And then some of the other designs have done CAD models. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's showing us that it's all about the visual storytelling of the concept here. And uh, so, so the wood grain, was that a directive from your client here, <laughs> Brian? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I, you know what, I honestly debated whether or not to have uh, their, uh, to put um, uh, the young ladies to put you guys artwork in there so we could have like a, a progression, but uh, they actually generated some ideas. And uh, I vividly remember, uh, and I, I actually looked at my notes again, that they, they wanted dark uh, wood paneling, like a like a, if my interpretation was like a frame, and uh, for it to look sleek and modern. So that so I just kind of took that 
uh, to mean that they were still being eco-friendly and wanting wanting it uh, to be of nature. So instead of it being just a, a, a wood paneling, let's make the entire frame uh, uh, wood. And uh, so yeah, that just came that everything you see came from uh, from the young ladies. So. Mm -hmm. Hey, any of you want to unmute and uh, just tell us a little bit about your experience and working with Brian and coming up with this idea? Yeah, um, so industrial design is actually my dream job. So this is a really a fun experience for me personally. Um, and we wanted to work to, you know, make a difference in low income communities because, um, you know, food deserts are, you know, prominent in low income communities. So we wanted to work against that and work to, you know, fix um, are we going to work to get healthy food people that are in the low income communities that can't get otherwise? Thank you, Serafina. Anyone else from your team? Well, thank you for the, the, the group effort here and working with Brian on this. You know, I'm starting to see a pattern here from some of these designs um, that's really just hitting home about when this topic is out thrown out there to the state and and we don't know how students are going to interpret it i'm seeing multiple designs here rooted in access you know the topic challenge is bringing quality food and it could have been designing packaging as we saw in the, in the escalator it could be um you know uh, restaurant equipment as as we saw in the automatic robot but here there's maybe the third or fourth design which is all about actually just getting the food to people and so they have access to it so you know that's clearly something that's even just uh collectively on on these students minds which i really find fascinating so silver award to Silla muhammad uh crop rotator uh, the Branch Area Career Center. Uh, Cole, so this is one of Marvin's students and he worked with Austin Clark from Tactile Design. Uh, the crop rotation idea is designed for residents living in a city with limited space to grow. So this is a really unique approach, looking at someone uh, who has a balcony or a rooftop and they really have a small amount of square footage to have a rooftop or, or patio garden. So how do you increase that in this rotating concept uh, Salah had was really interesting to us. Is Austin on here? Thought I saw Austin for a minute. So Austin um, worked here to design this um, triangular three-piece system that rotates um, called it Bloom and it's the limited space garden. This is a, a beautiful CAD model here that came from a series of sketches um, that he worked on after collaborating with Salah. Are you, are you here, Salah? Yes. Awesome, so why don't you tell us a little bit about the design? What was your thinking? About, thought about when I uh, was designing this is one like big cities, not just like small cities with like, uh, or, um, towns with like big uh, backyards or front yards, but like with cities who have barely none uh, space in their house to grow fresh foods. So this is like how I came up with this one. Yeah, I love the idea of just taking one piece of square footage and through a simple rotation mechanism and having the three trays you could rotate uh, with intelligent uh, solar amount of time that you could get with uh, the app control and be able to just uh, always make sure that each one is getting enough sunlight and uh, being able to water each one and the water could drip down to the, to the other units. So really cool, really cool idea. Thank you. So Austin here, these are really great sketches. You can see how a designer is using a digital sketch pad. These are um, not done on paper, but done on a digital screen, um, probably using Photoshop, I think he was using. Um, takes those sketches and I know he told me he kind of got the idea from some early just uh, references to just tinker toys, you know, how simple a lot of uh, structural ideas from an engineering perspective, uh, the designers, we, we play, we've designed robots and started the idea with a Lego. Um, you know, playing with Legos is, is something adults and engineers still do to figure stuff out. So it's really cool to see Austin here starting his idea out with just some Tinker Toy structures. And the gold award, uh, team of three here, Broxton Tobolowski, Austin Fullington, and Dawson uh, Poraditz. Sorry if I got the names wrong there. Um, but the G 
S or G3S Portable Greenhouse. Uh, and the other uh, branch area career center uh, winner with Marvin and their designer was Drew Lark from Zenith. And what we loved about this one as the board reviewed this one is that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's really the future, potential future of greenhouses and it's designed to extend the growing season. And I think we were really looking at the fact that it's looking at Michigan specifically and the challenge of the growing seasons here um, ideally being able to grow with the perfect amount of temperature control um, and sunlight in all seasons. So the design concept here that they worked with uh, Drew here, it, it actually slides along these mechanical um, uh, rods that can retract when it's summertime and you got plenty of sun. Um, they can close and uh, keep in moisture and uh, the temperature in the wintertime. And there's a whole series of different structural elements here. And actually the guys really delivered a lot of, uh, of this design. And Drew, I think similar to Brian, had a client who gave them uh, a pretty thorough design. And so um, is Drew on here or any of the gentlemen on the team? I think I'm, I'm just looking here real quick. There's so many people on the Zoom meeting. I see Broxton, um, anybody else in your team? Or Broxton, you can unmute and kind of tell us about your thoughts as you guys were developing this. Uh, so I have a background in farming and I understand like how all the growing seasons work and how the ability to earn, I guess not ability, but the challenges throughout the seasons. And when we heard about how it was about um, the possibility or the ability of trying to keep the crops growing during harder times, getting the season to expand, we were like thinking about how uh, like greenhouses, like they run all year round, but we want to make it even easier for people to work on. So we decided that we wanted to go for a portable one where you can move it back and forth. And it could only uh, go out during uh, certain temperatures and it would regulate what the temperature should be inside and out. Fantastic. And I mean, that's just, you know, really great that you're applying it to something that you personally have experience with. You know, you took the challenge, you interpret it, you really quickly identified a real problem and something that would benefit, um, you know, people in Michigan. So thank you. Thank you for the effort you guys put in. All right, so we're going to move to the collegiate category. This is a category that um, we have had uh, some years throughout the last uh, five or six. Um, and when we've been able to get some colleges to participate, we've opened it up to two colleges. So I, uh, I think we had it just two, uh, two years ago. We did not have it last year, but we were able to bring it back this year. Um, so CCS had uh, a sponsored uh, class kind of run this through um, a program, a full semester. And so the students here uh, took an entire semester and researched the problems and actually did a four month long project. So some of the students here maybe worked on it for two hours um, to come up with their idea. And some worked on it for days and days and weeks and weeks. Um, but these college students uh, actually worked on this concept for four months to get to these final concepts. And so uh, we, we, we really had a hard time actually narrowing it down. So we, we have an honorable mention in this one, um, which goes to Anastasia. And uh, her concept is him, a song of praise for the seasons. And I think what really uh, hit the board um, was this idea of bringing families together and celebrating seasons through a product that families can interact with while they cook food. And so I'm gonna show some of her concept sketches here, but what she's doing is actually creating a product where it enables you to cook food, but there's a thematic season to each of the concepts. And the one that's in the table here is if anybody's ever, is Anastasia on here? I didn't see you before. Are you here? Okay, so I'll explain here. So, so what she did was have, um, anybody ever done one of those spiral potato chip uh, fryers or seen those where you can slice potatoes and put them in your oven and actually kind of do like a frying thing. So what she did, she made a tree and this tree here, you can put any vegetables on it and you slide them on the tree and just put it right in your oven, bake them, uh, the fat drips off of them and you bring it out and you put it on the table and it's this amazing, beautiful centerpiece. And so that was just one of her four ideas. So it was really creative and we just loved the, uh, the family aspect and the, just the diversity of ways that you could have fun cooking. 
bronze goes to Bar Sarig. Uh, is is Bar on here? So the the uh, Ha Yarkon um, is is a, a a Jewish term that she had um, used to name the product. And uh, this is a grocery bag that encourages people to bike and commute. So she's living the college life and uh, thinking about going to, whether it's Eastern Market down by CCS and um, having to bring back the fresh food. So she looked at uh, the fact that it's really hard to carry it, carry it. And there are some bags for bikes that just, you know, they work, but they crunch your food or they don't have temperature sensitive compartments. Um, and there really isn't anything specific, even though people ride their bikes to the food market often in urban areas. So, so she tackled this problem. She uh, has experience in outdoor equipment and she designed this unit. What I love are some of the details on the inside. Um, again, you can see there's different uh, compartments here. These are where you could put your vegetables with little water trays so they stay fresh, uh, some temperature sensitive ones the two pieces that come off of your bike actually turn into backpacks. So you can see the back side here as a strap system and you can open it from a different size and they're, they're, then they turn back into a rack mount. So really, really cool, really creative uh, idea. And again, just looking at uh, uh, the sketch process and seeing all of her really uh, cool sketches so for all of you students here looking at, you know, when, when you get to college like a CCS and you're just learning drawing, the quality of her drawings here is, is fantastic work as she explored all the different sizes of the boxes and how they'd attach to the bike, um, how you'd interact with the zippers and the flaps and the straps. And, and she actually built this out as a full prototype as part of the project. Silver goes to Joshua Kim, Kokyo, the modern Chinapa. Uh, this design is, is a really cool approach to a communal garden that is unique because every person is placing a, a garden device out in water and creating a unique space. So I, I think I saw Josh logged in here. If you wanna tell us a little bit about your design concept, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Hey Josh, all right. So tell us a little bit about uh, Kokyo. So I got this idea when, um, well, first of all, the design prompt had to do with food and I wanted to look into utilizing space within a city, specifically Detroit. And while I was on, uh, while I was researching, I found out a lot of people were turning old homes into uh, uh, greenhouses or creating rooftop gardens. But in while I was thinking about that, I'm like, uh, Detroit is kind of growing, it's coming back, as people might say, and that means land will be taken up. So I was wondering how I could incorporate the water that we have surrounding the city and develop gardens that could possibly bring the community together. Of course, this was before COVID, but um, so I wanted to play on that. So I looked to the past to help influence my design. And uh, I looked specifically towards the Aztecs and their floating water gardens and how they used uh, hydroponic farming to both produce uh, fertilizer for the food on the water and uh, constantly water the water, uh, the, the produce. Yeah. Yeah. What I love about your design is that it's one pod. So the, so you're, you're manufacturing one unit, but then you flip it over. And if you flip it on one side, you can fill it with dirt and it becomes the garden. And then you flip it on the other side, it actually makes a walkway. So if you're looking at his rendering here, of the city, you could walk along the walking path and see the garden around you as you're walking. And no two gardens would be the same as people organically connect them. So they all interlock and they form a, a walking path with gardens. And you could put this on, like you said, like the, the, the riverfront of Detroit, you could put this in, a, in a, a pond or a lake. I mean, if you just had a pier and you wanted four of these next to your pier, you could do that. So I think that the versatility of the application was really interesting. And uh, just the beauty and, and art of it was, was uh, really fantastic. So awesome work on that, Joshua. Thank you. And gold goes to Ryan Davis for Honey Digs. So Ryan was looking at the, the, the dying bee population 
And also the fact that people that get into uh, having um, bees are kind of hobbyists. There's like two levels. There's the pros who do it at an industrial level, but there's a lot of bee hobbyists in um, Michigan. And so he wanted to create a new product for them. So I, I saw you, I think Ryan, are you still there? If you wanna tell us a little bit about your concept. Um, yeah, so right now, the uh, average age of a beekeeper or a bee apiarist is around 58 year old uh, male. And so really I wanted to make this more of like a, an inclusive hobby or um, maybe more genders and a larger age group could take part in this. Um, mainly because over the past 20 years, the bee population in Michigan has declined 50%. Uh, and that's not only in Michigan, but that's throughout the country as well. And so I wanted to make this immersive experience where you could actually kind of fold up, um, I guess these uh, wings are kind of like the ceiling and walk around the bee community. And you'd actually be able to see the queen bee working to make sure it's producing a new brood. Um, if you look at the circles going around, um, that's actually other areas where bees can produce honey. So I learned really a lot about the whole bee experience. I could get into the whole thing right now, but it might take a little while. But just the, the, the gist of it is the main part in the middle that you can see is where the queen would lay the main brood. Once that gets full, the bees can actually go out to other portals. And that's where the beekeeper could actually uh, take the honey from. I I really loved, as I was saying before, the emotional side of it that you tapped into in your research, which was that these these hobbyists, these these uh, these these people that love bees and have uh, uh, an apiary uh, on their property, you know, they love to share their honey. They love to show people when they come over. Um, and I think this idea of this umbrella opening. And allowing the person in your drawing here, uh, rendering here does this perfectly. They go into the hive. Right now, hives are just these boxes that are static and the person has to walk around them. But your idea to create this umbrella where the person can enter inside, almost enter the hive and see all of these hanging uh, hive circles as like pendants or ornaments hanging from this umbrella to me was just such a great connection from what you heard in the research and then artistically visualizing a new experience and then solving the functional elements of how do you channel uh, the main brood in the middle out to these separate wings and have access points and the solar power to control the temperature throughout the seasons. So I mean, you, you to me checked all the boxes and, that, and that's why you, you, you know, you're, you're getting gold on this one is because you took the research, you had the emotional side of it, the experience, solving a functional problem and helping the bee population in Michigan. So really, you know, fantastic work. Thank you, I appreciate it. And I just wanna thank the uh, council as well for taking a look at this and uh, just taking a look at some of the work that I did. Um, it was a great semester and thank you Byron for having me. Um, it was just, it was a great experience. Absolutely. All right, so that wraps it up and time to announce the next challenge. So as we thought about what to do for next year, it made sense to work on how all of us here in a virtual scenario or in social distance scenarios, how can we continue to interact and have fun? I think, you know, we're trying uh, uh, to look at new social distance ways to have fun. I've seen um, my daughter's school do some really cool, creative, interactive ways to have fun. And so we're gonna be going through the next six months some of us here are in virtual scenarios. Some of us are in hybrid scenarios. Some schools in the state are still in person. Um, everyone has different experiences, but we think it's really important to still connect, interact with other people, engage, have fun. So what we wanted to do was have people design a game, an interactive craft or project or a toy that helps create a fun and meaningful engagement with their friends or family during times of social distancing. So this meaningful engagement can be through safe in-person activities, or you could come up with a virtual 
engagement. It could be something you do through Zoom possibly. Um, it could be car to car. I've seen driveway parties. I've seen parking lot parties. You know, I've seen people in, a, I drove by a high school and there was a crowd of cars in a circle with all their trunks open and people were, you know, trying to interact safely in the parking lot, having kind of like a trunk party. So it might be through snail mail. What if you were then going to just, you know, have a game where it was kind of like a pen pal activity? There's so many different ways to look at this challenge. And I think the kids can be really creative in how building off of things that they've been doing over the last 10 months or things that they would like to do that don't exist yet and is really going to give them an opportunity to have fun with it. It's rooted in a product. So it's a game, it's a project, it's a craft, it's a toy, something tangible, um, but rooted really in, in a meaningful experience that, that I think kids across the state are obviously all going to have different uh, experiences that they can use to come, come up with something creative. So we will start rolling this out. We'll update our website. Um, pretty soon we're going to get into um, pushing that out on all of our channels. Uh, what we're going to do this year is we're going to keep the contest open through the school year into June. So in the past, in a normal year, we try to end in March and then have the um, ceremony in June. But because this whole year started late, there's no way we're going to get there. So what we're going to do is have the contest open all the way through when your school ends in June and then connect all the mentors over the summer. And it really actually worked well this year to do summer into fall mentorships, but we're going to have the finalists selected over the summer. We're going to start pairing up the mentors over the summer and then try and get the ceremony kicked off as soon as we possibly can. Probably we're going to target September when the school year starts so we can close that year and then relaunch the following year in September, October timeframe and actually get back on cycle with the full school calendar year. So um, if you have any questions again, reach out to us. Um, I, I, again, I'm looking up, I, sorry, I have two screens here because I have one I've got the presentation on one I'm looking at all the people attending here. And I'm just really happy that there are, at one point there was 75 people, I think, and we still have 61 of you that have stuck around this long. Um, I, again, I have to thank all the teachers and all the parents, of course, the students. I have to thank uh, uh, Jeff and Katie and Diane. I have to thank Chrissy, our administrator for making this possible. Thank you to CCS for sending out that awesome uh, box of goods and Don for giving us some of your time tonight. And we're excited about the future partnership with CCS on this. And uh, really just everybody wants to unmute and, uh, <laughs> and just, you know, thank you for everything this year. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Great. Dave. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Had a blast. I'll stick around for a couple of minutes here if anybody has any questions. Um, but hey, that's it. You're free to go. Go have dinner. I'm glad we actually got done uh, uh, within time, also. Um, but anybody got any questions, uh, feel free to hang out and, and, and we can chit chat for a minute. <laughs> Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, everyone. It's great work. Thank you. Thank you, Marvin. All right, thank you, everyone. It's great. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Danielle, I see a, a note from uh, uh, Monica William. Yes, we're going to make sure that those final renderings that we just showed tonight, they'll get uh, sent out to all of the, the parents and teachers. So we'll follow up with emails and make sure that you have uh, the final designs that your students collaborated with, with the designers. That's awesome. Thank you. Okay, so Dave, you guys are taking care of that, you said? Yes, yeah, we'll, we'll follow up uh, emailing you like a, a nice high res JPEG of the renderings and the designs uh, that the designers did. So you have a copy of that. And uh, yeah, I did record this. So this is on, um, this will have to process in the Zoom cloud. And then after the Zoom cloud recording processes, then we'll get this posted. Um, so we're gonna have to give us a little bit of time. But we'll, we'll just email out the link uh, probably to the recording and then uh, eventually we'll get it updated onto our website.
Good. Awesome. All right. Thanks, you guys. Have a good night. Thanks. <laughs> I'd like to thank the Design Council for everything they do. Thank you very much. Thanks, Marvin. Yep. Take it easy. Talk to you in the, in the future. Absolutely. Yeah, Christy, let me know if uh, I, I got the chat box here, so I'm gonna I'm gonna capture the chat and uh, I'll I'll see uh, if there's any other questions in here. But let me know if you saw anything, and if anybody sends you an email in the in the next few days to the info, um, let me know, and then we'll connect. Sounds good. I didn't see really any other questions. Just um, I think Trisha was looking for the slides, but yeah, we'll have that. Hey, Dave. Hey, Katie. Hi, I just wanted to say before I signed off that I think you did a great job. Um, and it was excellent to hear a little bit from the designers and the kids. It just filled out the concepts. And that's kind of a new thing. We haven't done that before. Yeah, you know what happens? I think this has been happening at work a lot is that when you're forced to do something like this, no matter what, even if we go back to an in-person, I, that is something exactly that I felt really helped tonight. And I'm going to make sure we do that in the future too. Yeah, I agree. And, and I don't know, like, I think the, um, one of the affordances of being online is that it felt a little bit more like a collective conversation about design and, you know, uh, a little bit more together, strangely, than having people come up. The, I guess it's not so formal. And, and I love the way that people just kind of interacted with each other around the designs and seeing the chats like I, so um, anyway, I just, I just thought it went well. So just wanted to share.